Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhassa Buddhang tamang sankang namasami So, continuing on the topic of samadhi, yesterday I spoke a bit about the standard five characteristics of first jhana. Uh, and before going further with describing jhana in particular, uh, I would like to bring forward one very simple definition of jhana. You know, this comes from my preceptor. Uh, he said, uh, jhana is when the mind is free of the five hindrances and doesn't move from its object. It's a very simple definition. Uh, but in order for that definition to be useful, we need to know what the five hindrances are. Who here is familiar with the five hindrances? Pali word is nivarana. Sometimes avarana, but nivarana is the more common term. Um, so the five hindrances, or five obstacles, five obstructions, uh, these are things that prevent the mind from making progress in meditation. Uh, so it's useful to be familiar with what they are, uh, what to watch out for, uh, how to um, identify them and pull the mind away from them when they arise. So the five nivarana, the five hindrances, are um, interest in sensuality, aversion, uh, dullness and drowsiness, Adacha kukucha, which is restlessness and remorse, and vichikicha, which is skeptical doubt. That's five. Um, so this, uh, the first one, so interest in sensuality. Uh, so the most extreme form of this is craving for intense sensual pleasures of some sort. Um, so fantasizing about sexual activity or craving for food or uh, craving for movies or entertainment or, or things of that sort. Uh, so that's the most extreme form of, of interest and sensuality. Uh, and these are things which um, I think we can all readily see are quite obstructive to the development of samadhi. Uh, so when we're sitting there fantasizing about pizza and movies or whatever it is you fantasize about, I'm not going to speculate. That's for you to know and me to never find out. Uh, so <laughs> when, when you're fantasizing about whatever it is you fantasize about, the mind is far from samadhi. Uh, the mind is very clearly on something other than the meditation object. Um, and uh, this also applies to more subtle sensual objects. So any sensory experience is a sensual experience. So uh, being interested in any kind of sensory experience other than the meditation is a distraction. Um, so it can be something quite neutral. Uh, like maybe you hear some birds chirping outside and you're like, oh, so lovely, so lovely. Uh, well, then you're not meditating anymore. You're doing something else. Uh, your mind is no longer on the object. Um, or maybe you start thinking about these beautiful Buddha and Bodhisattva statues that keep magically appearing in the monastery, uh, which I have to say is just magnificent. Um, so ever since we opened this place, we've had this, this gradual stream of Buddhist artwork appearing, which is wonderful. If anybody has more that they want to contribute to this space, you're welcome. We have lots and lots of space. Statues, wall hangings, tapestries, whatever you've got, if you want it to be put up here, or if you know somebody who might want to contribute things, it's certainly appreciated. Uh, but also, if you're in, in the meditation hall and your mind is drifting towards that beautiful guanyin that just appeared, 
Uh, well, then you're actually not doing your meditation statue. Uh, oh, see, there I go. Wow. <laughs> Who am I talking about here? Hmm. Uh, then you're not actually doing your meditation object anymore. You're not actually using the meditation method anymore. You're just thinking about wanting to go and look at that, that statue. Uh, and this is an example of something which by itself is quite wholesome. So actually to look at a, uh, a Buddhist icon is, generally speaking, it's a wholesome activity uh, because it reminds us of our highest aspirations. Uh, you look at the statue of a Buddha and it reminds you of the wisdom that we're trying to develop. You look at a statue of Guan Yin and it reminds you of the compassion that we're trying to develop. Uh, you look at a statue of Maitreya and it reminds us of the joy that we're trying to develop. Uh, so there's all these, uh, these reminders, wholesome reminders that we can get uh, through directing the mind towards wholesome sensory experiences. But nonetheless, while we are doing that, we're not doing our meditation practice. That's something else. Uh, so it's still wholesome. Like yesterday I mentioned that uh, recollection of the Buddha uh, can be a very effective way of bringing up joy and happiness and serenity in the mind. Um, so that is a valid form of meditation. Uh, in fact, one samadhi object that you can use is to uh, either gaze at uh, a Buddhist image, so gazing at a Buddha or a Bodhisattva statue, uh, and you just uh, keep, keep your eyes softly focused on the, on the Buddha image um, and let that be your object. So using the Buddha statue as a visual meditation object is totally fine. The last few days I've been sitting right in front of the, the white Guanyin statue in the meditation hall and it's been wonderful. Uh, whenever I open my eyes, there's that reminder, that reminder of, of gentleness. Uh, of compassionate wisdom. Um, and similarly, you can visualize uh, a Buddha or a Bodhisattva as a mind-made meditation object. That's also a perfectly valid way to practice. So if that is your meditation object, if that's what you're doing, then it's fine. Uh, but if you're using a different meditation object, for example, if you're focusing on your body uh, or on your breathing, uh, or on metta, uh, or whatever it is you're doing, uh, and you're just getting bored with it and you want to think about the pretty statues, well, that's just this first hindrance arising. That's not the recollection of the Buddha or recollection of bodhisattvas. That's just distraction. It's just interest and sensuality. Uh, so this one, mm, it can be quite sticky uh, in that we... Uh, fundamentally, humans are sensual beings. Uh, so in the Buddhist description of, of cosmology, the Buddhist description of the different states of being, um, there's three major categories of realms of existence. Uh, the sensual realm, the material realm, and the immaterial realm. Um, and humans, along with animals and the lower devas and the beings in unpleasant states, uh, are all in the sensual realm. Uh, so our existence is defined by our sensory experiences. It's defined by um, interacting through the body uh, with the outside world. So interacting with sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Uh, and from the time we're born, we're constantly relating through our senses. Uh, so we tend to have a deeply rooted obsession with seeing, hearing, tasting, smelling, and touching. It's a deeply rooted obsession with eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind. Well, mind we'll get to later. But eye, ear, nose, tongue, and body, we have this deep obsession with them. Uh, so it's good to really watch that. Uh, watch for that. Notice when it arises. Notice when we start to get interested in any kind of sensory experience other than our meditation object. Uh, and recognize it for what it is. It's just a distraction. Uh, it's just the mind flopping around 
Uh, it's just the mind uh, expressing its boredom and dissatisfaction. Uh, but that expression of boredom and dissatisfaction, if we give in to it, will simply generate more dissatisfaction. It doesn't solve anything. Whereas if we stay on our meditation and we let that sensual thought drift away, uh, then we can actually find the peace and serenity that we're looking for. And the mind can move in the direction of samadhi. The second major hindrance is aversion. Uh, so an extreme form of this is thoughts of hatred or resentment or cruelty, thoughts of, of vengeance, of um, ill will. So the very extreme forms of it are, are actually wishing to cause harm to another living being. That's the most extreme form. Um, more subtle forms is just whenever we have any experience and we respond to it with disliking. So it can be something very subtle or something less subtle. It might be the sound of the person next to you breathing. Uh, it might be the lights in the hall being too bright or too dim. Uh, it might be the temperature a little too cold, a little too warm. Um, it might be some aching in the body, some physical sensation arising in the body. Um, there's a lot of different things that we can choose to hate. In fact, every moment is presenting us with thousands of, of different things to hate. Uh, but what happens when we turn our minds towards aversion? I don't like this, I don't like that, I want this to stop, I want that to change. Uh, well, what happens? Well, we lose our samadhi. We lose our practice. We lose our meditation. Uh, and we slip into a very disturbed, unhappy, unpleasant state of mind. Um, and this can happen extremely quickly. In fact, often it happens so quickly that we don't even recognize that we've made a choice. We're just sitting there and then we're like, God damn it, what the hell is wrong with these people? And we immediately start thinking that it's somebody else's fault that we're unhappy. It's somebody else's fault that our samadhi is bad. It's somebody else's fault that the meditation's not going well. Uh, and we start looking around for who to blame. Uh, like, it must be somebody else's fault. It can't possibly be my fault. Of course not. Uh, or maybe we think it is our fault. Maybe we're angry at ourselves. Maybe we have resentment towards ourselves. Um, maybe we think that we're, we're not very good at this. Um, and we start coming up with reasons to, to have aversion and ill will towards ourselves. Um, or, or again, quite often during the course of a meditation period, quite often it's towards our bodies. There's some sensation arising in the body and we decide to hate it. That's what pain is. Pain is the decision to hate a physical sensation. So we can see how destructive that is to our samadhi. Uh, whenever we're caught up in any kind of disliking, then the mind is agitated. It's unstable. It can't stay with its object for any period of time. Uh, and even when we try to put the mind on the object, it's always wavering. Uh, because it's always trying to squirm away from whatever it dislikes. Uh, or it's always getting wrapped up in, in irritation towards what it dislikes. So watching for that aversion when it arises. And when you do notice it arising, drop the story. Uh, drop whatever justification we have for why we're right to feel annoyed. Uh, it's like maybe someone's breathing loudly and we're like, how dare they? They must be doing that on purpose. Don't they know that we don't do that kind of breathing in Buddhism? Uh, and we start generating all this anger and hatred and, uh, and, well, what are we actually doing? We're just breaking our own samadhi. So the person who's not practicing Buddhism in that case is us. It's the person who's sitting there stewing in resentment about somebody else's breathing patterns. That's the person who's not practicing. Who knows what's going on with other people? Uh, most of us can't read minds. Anybody here think they can read minds? 
No? Okay. I've only met a handful of people in my life who seem to have something along those lines. So it's not very common. Um, but there are some people who have, have such abilities. I'm not one of them, so you can relax. <laughs> um, and it was really amusing. I was talking to my preceptor once uh, about exactly this. So like monks who can read minds. And he said, yeah, there certainly are monks who can read minds, uh, but most of them don't bother uh, because they really don't want to see what's going on in your minds. <laughs> it's usually not very pretty. Um, uh, so, yeah, we really don't know what's going on in other people's minds. We don't really know what's going on in their bodies, for that matter. Uh, so whenever we get lost in judgment, that's just coming from a place of ignorance, a place of misunderstanding, uh, a place of incomplete information. Um, so when we notice that happening, again, drop the story and just look at the feeling of aversion, the feeling of ill will, the feeling of irritation, the feeling of resentment, the feeling of anger. Uh, just look at that feeling. Recognize how harmful it is, how destructive it is, how unpleasant it is, how counterproductive it is. And recognize that it's something that we're doing. It's something that we're generating, something that we're creating moment by moment. It doesn't need to be there. So if we stop feeding it, it'll fade away. And the moment we disengage from it, then we can return to our samadhi practice and we'll notice that it's much stronger, it's much clearer. And you don't need to worry about whatever it was that was bothering you a moment ago because it's not bothering you anymore. It's really interesting how this works. So one moment we're thinking, if I could just silence that ticking noise, then everything would be fine. Uh, but then you decide to stop being irritated by the ticking sound and then you're just like, oh, there's actually nothing wrong. Something was wrong a moment ago, but it wasn't the ticking noise. Uh, it was my own misdirected mind. That was what the problem was. We're still going to try to take care of the ticking noise, by the way. Um, but maybe not today. Mm. And dullness and drowsiness. Uh, so sometimes uh, this is actually caused by insufficient sleep. Sometimes. Uh, during a meditation retreat, that's very rarely what causes dullness and drowsiness. Uh, during a meditation retreat, you might feel like you're not getting enough sleep, but actually you're getting plenty of sleep. Um, so I've been very generous when I wrote the schedule to allow seven full hours at night very generous. In many retreat centers, you get four. So I've given you almost twice as much a sleep allowance as you can reasonably expect. I'm not making this up. Um, so the first time my preceptor did a month-long retreat, this was 40 years ago or so, actually, even longer than that. It was well before he became a monk. 45 years ago? Something like that. Um, so he was on this meditation retreat, uh, and after a few days, he went in for consultation with the teacher, and the teacher just asked, like, oh, so how much have you been sleeping at night? And my preceptor said, oh, I've been doing really well. I've only been sleeping six hours. And the teacher was like, what? You've been sleeping six hours? That's terrible. You've been stealing sleep. From now on, only two hours. So he tried. He tried doing two hours, and, and after a few days, that wasn't working terribly well, so he went up to four, uh, which is the amount you're actually supposed to sleep in that retreat center. Um, but he said something interesting happened as a result of that, was he realized that he actually didn't really need more than four or five hours of sleep. We think we need lots of sleep, but during the course of a meditation retreat, we're doing very little activity, very little physical activity, very little mental activity. Uh, we're spending a lot of our time just sitting uh, or slowly walking. 
So we're using up very little energy, which means you actually don't need very much sleep. Uh, and also we're developing samadhi. Uh, and the stronger your samadhi gets, the more energized the mind becomes and the less need the mind has for sleep. Uh, so seven hours, actually after a few days of retreat, you might find that seven hours is too much. You might find that naturally you're waking up at three in the morning, long before the wake-up bell. And that's fine. So long story short, dullness and drowsiness uh, happening during a meditation retreat is very rarely physically caused, unless you're really not sleeping at night. It's very rarely caused by the body. Um, it's usually caused by a lack of interest in the meditation. Sometimes there's other reasons, but this is the most common one. Most commonly, we're just not really interested in the meditation practice that we're doing. So we try to escape, and we can't escape physically because we're sitting in the meditation hall, and it would be pretty obvious if we like suddenly jump up and run out of the hall. So we escape mentally uh, by shutting off. Uh, so this is usually the reason why. Um, so in that case, it's really important to take an interest in the meditation object. Um, and the more closely you pay attention to your meditation object, the more interesting it becomes. Um, so when you find that you're getting bored with the meditation, remind yourself that the boredom is self-generated. Remind yourself that interest can also be self-generated. So really look closely at the meditation object. Examine it very closely. Look for something interesting. Really ask yourself, what's going on here? What is this really? What is it really? And examine it closely. And you'll start to find that it's absolutely fascinating. If we choose to be fascinated, then it's fascinating. So this is the direct method. This is the method that I most, most highly recommend. Um, don't change the object. Instead, actively take an interest in the object. Uh, and then you might find that your, your, drow your drowsiness fades away. That mental dullness fades away. Um, if you try that and it's really not working, uh, open your eyes. If you've been meditating with your eyes closed, you can meditate with your eyes half open. Um, just make sure you're not moving your eyes around, um, but just let them rest in a semi-unfocused way. Uh, and just having your eyes slightly open can do wonders for keeping the mind alert. If you're still having a lot of trouble, um, then you can try changing your meditation object. This can be done. Um, again, it's not your first option, but it can be your third or fourth option, changing your meditation object to something else that's more interesting, or changing the way you're using your meditation object to be more interesting. Um, so this is an example where you might find that a moving meditation object can be helpful. Um, so if you've been focusing on the body as a still unmoving object, you might try moving your mind through the body uh, just as a way of, of having some kind of activity uh, to keep the mind awake. You won't get very good samadhi this way, but you won't get very good samadhi if you're fast asleep in the meditation hall either. Um, so it's better to be awake with a moving object than asleep with no object at all. Um, and if that's still not working, then you can stand up. It's much harder to fall asleep doing standing meditation, though I have seen it happen. I have. There was one time when uh, I was in the meditation hall. This was many years ago at a, another monastery. We're all in the meditation hall, meditating very peacefully, and suddenly there's this huge whomp. And we look around, and it was, it was one, of the, one of the postulants had fallen asleep doing standing meditation and had just completely <laughs> tumbled on his back right there in the meditation hall. Um, that's the one and only time I've seen this happen, by the way. 
I don't remember exactly what was going on with him. He had some kind of health problem or something. Um, that's quite unusual. I think that's the only time I've ever actually seen it happen. Generally speaking, if you're doing standing or walking, you won't fall asleep. So here we are keeping a, a pretty solid standard of uh, if you're in the meditation hall, stay. Either do sitting or standing. Um, but under less strict settings, uh, it's sometimes recommended that if you're really having a hard time staying awake, even with standing, that then to do walking meditation. So I don't recommend that here, um, just because of the setup we have. That's not, not what we're doing this time around. But do try standing meditation. And usually that, that clears that up. Um, the fourth major hindrance is, uh, in Pali, it's called uddacha kukucha, uh, which is two separate but related qualities of mind. So uddacha is restlessness or agitation. Uh, and what we're particularly interested in here is mental restlessness, mental agitation. Uh, with the body, sometimes you'll feel this kind of twitchiness in the body, this kind of physical agitation. But actually, if you just don't play along with it, then it fades away on its own. Uh, it's not something that you need to worry about. Uh, it's the mental agitation that's a bit more troublesome. Um, and often this also comes from boredom. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, when we're sitting in meditation, our mind only really has a couple ways to escape. One is through falling asleep. The other is through self-distraction. So agitation and restlessness is often a symptom that we're not particularly interested in the meditation that we're doing. Um, in which case, once again, either actively take an interest in the meditation or change up the way you're meditating a little bit uh, so that it's more interesting, so it's more appealing. Mm. Other things that you can do, uh, if your eyes are open, try closing them. Uh, often that helps. Having less sensory input can sometimes help reduce the mental restlessness. Paradoxically, it can also work the other way. Sometimes with our eyes closed, there's restlessness, and then you let them open, and the mind settles down a little bit. So you can try that as well. Um, so if your eyes are open, try closing them. If they're closed, try opening them. Um, another thing that works surprisingly well for restlessness is to allow your posture to slump just a little bit. So not very much. We're talking maybe an inch or so. Uh, so not like a full like collapse, but just like uh, just a slight slumping of the body uh, can help bring a sense of ease to the mind. Um, another thing that helps a lot with restlessness, and this can also help a lot with aversion, by the way, um, is to make a, a conscious effort to relax the muscles around your forehead and eyes. So often when there's a lot of restlessness or agitation or irritation in the mind, then there's this tightening that happens uh, in the forehead or around the eyes, sometimes in the, the um, jaw region. So just actively relaxing the facial muscles, and especially the upper half of the face. Uh, that can make a tremendous difference towards settling down the mind. Um, and uh, another option, and this is to be saved for when everything else is not working, uh, is you can bring, bring your fingers up and just gently massage the area around your eyes. And that can help to soothe away that tension. Uh, and often that does seem to have a soothing effect on the mind. Um, the reason why that's not recommended is because it is, in fact, physical movement. And as I hope I've emphasized enough, any physical movement will weaken samadhi. Uh, so the more still we hold, the more still the mind will be. The more still the body is, the more still the mind is. 
Um, so actually, that can be another thing for dealing with restlessness, is just really make a strong effort to let the body be as completely still as possible. And you might notice that when you get the body absolutely rock solid still, that the restlessness turns into brightness. The agitation turns into attention. The fifth hindrance is skeptical doubt. Chen Pali is vichikicca, skeptical doubt. Uh, and uh, this can take a wide variety of forms. Uh, most commonly, though, it's some kind of active thinking in the mind, uh, expressing doubt about the meditation that we're doing, expressing doubt about whether meditation is worth doing at all, doubt about whether the Buddha was enlightened, doubt about whether the monk knows what he's talking about, doubt about whether it was a good idea to come on this retreat. Um, so it can be all kinds of, of doubts coming up. Uh, but most commonly in the context of the five hindrances, uh, it's doubts of this sort. So doubts which have some relation to the efficacy or value of the practices that we're doing. Um, so in that case, it's important to recognize that in order to know whether or not there is value to these methods, we have to give them a sincere try. And as long as we're sitting here doubting whether or not they're any good, we're not trying them. It's kind of like if, if you've never had uh, a particular kind of food before. Um, and someone brings it to you and says, uh, here, you should try this. And you're like, nope, I hate it. You're like, well, how do you know? You haven't even tried it. You're like, nope, I definitely hate it. So you have to actually make the effort to try it out before you have any clue as to whether or not you like it. And you might try it and be like, oh, yeah, yeah, I hate it. Um, or you might try it and be like, well, actually, this is OK. Uh, or you might try it and you think, oh, this is fabulous. Uh, so it's the same uh, with our meditation practice. If we're just like, okay, I don't think this works. This is a waste of time. Nope, nope, nope. Well, we're not actually finding out for ourselves. Uh, we're just dwelling in some preconceived idea, which is not based on experience. Uh, it's just based on, on preconceived mm, ideas, which have come from who knows where. Past conditioning, you know, prejudice, who knows. So in order to really understand uh, what these practices are and what they're good for, or whether they're good for anything at all, we need to give them a sincere try uh, to put down our, our skepticism for a period of time uh, and really make a sincere effort, uh, really put forth a, a good try and see what happens. So uh, again, coming back to this basic definition of jhana, when the mind is free of the five hindrances and it stays on its object. That's jhana. That's it. Think we can do that? Think we can try? Okay, let's try. <laughs>